Thank you for making our times of worship so awesome as you join in and we join our voices together. The chief aim of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Hallelujah. And in this place, we enjoy our God as we worship Him. And I enjoy His presence as I experience His presence about me and within me. And I know that He's doing the same for others in this, in this place. That maybe you come in here with, in need of healing, or you come in here depressed, or you come in here with some shattered emotion, or, and you just surrender it all to the Lord. And you have His presence holding you. And you have His Holy Spirit coming in on the inside and putting you back together. It's truly beautiful. God's presence, there is nothing to even come close. And one day we leave this place and we go into His presence in a whole new way. What a glorious day that will be. Now last Sunday we spoke about the finished work of Christ on the cross. And then we went on to celebrate communion together. And what a beautiful morning we had. Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. Perfect and spotless. A once and for all sacrifice for the sin of the world. What kind of a God would do that, eh? What kind of a God would lay down his life for those who were in rebellion to him? The God we serve is beyond comprehension. He is a good God. That which Jesus did on the cross is a complete work. And you've got to catch that. You've got to catch the fact that it was a complete work or you will be battling things throughout life, battling to accept, battling to receive, battling to earn your way. You will be battling, battling, battling. The finished work of Christ on the cross was a complete work. If we choose desire Think that we need to add something more to that. We are trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus. We are saying, Lord Jesus, what you did was insufficient. And I need to add to that to complete it. Nonsense. There is nothing we can add to what Jesus did. It is a finished work on the cross. We cannot improve it. It was a perfect once and for all. Sacrifice. God is a sovereign God, which means that He can do whatever He likes. You know, when you come and you stand and you dedicate your child to Jesus, you are saying, Lord, whatever direction you have for my child is okay. I am releasing them to you so that you can lead them into that which you have for them. We serve a sovereign God. And we have been bought with a price. We are not our own anymore. We belong to Him. We belong to the sovereign God. He can do whatever He chooses. And He has decided that this is how salvation shall work. Through the sacrificial death of His Son on the cross. Now the kingdom of God is God's rule and reign in the hearts of His people. That is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. When we submit our lives to Jesus, and we say, Lord, not our will, but Your will be done. I am laying down myself for You. I am picking up my cross to follow You. That is when the kingdom of God is, is working within you. You are not seeking your own desires, your own will, your own path. You are submitting it to His rule and to His reign. Because we were created to rule and reign, but not outside of Him. He rules and reigns within us, and out of that we rule and reign. And it is His desire to commune with us and to have fellowship with us the way 
we are experiencing this morning with God in this place. And this salvation, which is done in accordance to His will, us receiving Jesus in faith, repenting of our sin, turning from it, looking to Him. Remember the apost- the, you remember John in the book of Revelation? He turned to see the voice that was speaking. When God speaks, you need to turn. You need to turn away and you need to turn to Him. He's not a God that you carry on on your cell phone or reading your newspaper. Yeah, God, I, I'm kind of hearing you. You know, like some of you do with your wives. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What was that? We need to turn. And we need to face our God and say, Lord, I need you. I'm dependent upon you. Such a person who has turned away to face Jesus and says, Sorry, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my rebelliousness, for all sin is rebellion. It's rebellion to God, that's what sin is. Forgive me, I choose you. I choose to follow you. Wash me clean with your blood. Fill me with your spirit. I choose you. For every person that has done that, they have eternal life now. That person has changed. That person who was in the kingdom of darkness doing that which they want to do. Not understanding, not comprehending the bigger picture. Just doing what they want to do. Has all of a sudden, the lights have been turned on. And instead of the kingdom of darkness, they are now following Jesus. They are stepping into the light. Jesus is the light. They are illuminated on the inside. Things that you used to do that you were comfortable with, you are no longer comfortable with. For the Holy Spirit has quickened you to life. You say, Lord, I need to do away. I need to change. I want to follow you. Help me, Lord. I can't do this on my own. I need you. Through repentance, we turn from sin. We look into the face of Jesus. And we receive His forgiveness. It is a finished work. I can't add to that. I can't do more than what Jesus has done. But when I in faith come to Him and say, Lord, forgive me. It's a finished work. Through repentance. Through your faith in Him. Through grace you have been saved. By faith. A finished work work. The Holy Spirit comes in and seals you for that day of redemption. You have the seal of the Holy Spirit. It is your promise from God. You need to know that when you have come into that new covenant with Jesus, it is a finished work. You cannot add to it. 1 John 1 9 says, if we, this is in the Amplified, If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, He is faithful and just, true to His own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us continually from all unrighteousness, our wrongdoing, everything not in conformity with His will and purpose. And as a result of this process of salvation, God sends His Holy Spirit to take up residence within us. The presence of God, and you've got to catch that. You have the presence of God inside of you. That needs to burn within you with such a love, such an understanding that this almighty God that created the universe, He is living within me. I am a new creation. Don't judge me by my past. I don't live there any longer. I am a new creation in Jesus. It's got to burn within you, folks. The presence of God. When we come together, we build the temple of the Most High God. As I come with the Holy Spirit in me, and you come with the Holy Spirit in you, and in unity, we serve this Almighty God. 
we build something that we don't understand. Something that is beautiful to God through unity, all through the power of His Spirit. From that point on, you have salvation. You have eternal life. Listen to Hebrews 10, 14 from the Amplified. This is amazing. Listen to this. I'm reading from the Amplified because I generally use the New King James and you get used to me saying certain things. I want to say it differently, but I want to say it in accordance to God's Word. For by the one offering He has perfected forever and completely cleanse those who are being sanctified, bringing each believer to spiritual completion and maturity. And the Holy Spirit also adds His testimony to us in confirmation of this. For after having said, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws upon their heart and in their mind I will inscribe them, producing an inward change. He then says, and their sins and their lawless acts, I will remember no more. No longer holding their sins against them. Now where there is absolute forgiveness and complete cancellation of the penalty of these things, there is no longer any offering to be made to atone for sin. How beautifully the author of Hebrews puts that. This whole process of salvation through grace and faith is tied up in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, where it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What a complete cleansing Jesus has done for us. It should be transforming our mind. We need to be transformed. We need to be renewed. We need this burning of the Holy Spirit within us to set us on fire up here as well as here. Because temptation doesn't end the day you get to salvation. It probably increases. Because before that day, the enemy was not too worried about you. You were on your way to hell. He was happy with that. But now you have turned and you are on your way to heaven. And everything of God, everything that God loves, Satan hates. Everything. So in all likelihood, when you come to salvation, you may endure Temptation more than what you had in the past. Don't be surprised. You know, when Jesus came out of the water and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove settled upon him. And God, Father God said, this is my son in whom I will well please. What was the next thing that happened to him? He was led into the wilderness to be tempted. Jesus. Let us not be surprised if after coming to salvation, if after putting our life right, we go through a time of temptation where the enemy is trying to destroy you, trying to pull you down. But you need to know your God. Your God is far above. He is, in, he is there and He is living within you. He is far above anything the enemy can do. He is far above any power of the enemy. Any, any discouragement that the enemy can bring, our God is more than enough. He is more than enough for you. And He is living inside of you. You need to embrace Him. You need to say, Lord, all I need is You. Christ is my all sufficiency. Just You and I, we can do this, Lord. But what happens if after we've come to salvation, we find ourselves sinning? How does it impact this whole scenario that we've laid out? Well, first of all, when you sin after salvation, you join the rest of this group. Because every one of us has sinned. 
even after being washed clean. You've had that thought. You've done that thing. You've said that word. You have sinned. There's not one of us that can stand before the Father saying, Lord, I stand before you having not sinned. Because God says you'll be a liar. Unfortunately, from Adam, we have inherited a sinful nature. And that is why we needed the second Adam, Jesus Christ, to come and set us free from that sinful nature. And we say, thank you, Lord Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. We had inherited death through our sin, which we inherited from Adam. But Jesus came and he set us free from the penalty of that death. He gave us new life. And as a spirit being, when Jesus cleanses you, as a spirit being, you are cleansed to perfection. You are cleansed and made whole. You are righteous before the Father as a spirit being. But what I have noticed is my flesh was lagging behind. As a spirit being, I am standing made in perfection before God. But as a, spirit, as a fleshly being, I still had habits. I still had things. I still had temptations. And the spirit came and said, this is why I am with you. I'm going to walk with you. I am going to help you. I'm going to help you walk a different path. I'm going to quicken to your understanding that which brings pain to the Father's heart, that which brings tears to His heart. I am going to stir you to be this new creation in Christ Jesus. If a person of 40 years old comes to salvation, he's had 40 years of flesh, 40 years of habits, 40 years of stuff, which the Holy Spirit is saying, come, I can help you do better. Come, come with me. Come walk with me. We can shed that. We can do this. And every time we fall, he's there and he's reaching down and he takes us by the hand and he says, come on, get up. We can do better. The ability to sin is still with us in our flesh, in this physical world, in these fleshly bodies. The problem is as we entertain that flesh, we open up channels of communication into the spirit realm. So we have been set free. The curse that was upon us has been taken off. The death that we, were, that we had has been replaced with new life. But it is still possible. To turn and open up channels of communication. We don't have much good to say about the devil, but he's not lazy. You give him a foothold and he will be there. He will have his foot in that door before you know it. And the Bible says, do not give the enemy a foothold. Every time we sin, we bow our knee to Satan. We take glory that belongs to God. And we give it to the enemy. And we, we give over legal rights to his forces. To those devils that he has that want to bring you down. We give legal right. That legal right that, was, that Jesus has taken back. We can give it the way Adam gave title deed to planet earth to Satan. So too, we can give legal right. And the enemy has no good thing planned for you that I can promise you. His job is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that is what he wants to do in your life. He can't destroy you as a newly created spirit being. But he can hit you at a fleshly level. He can bring sickness and disease. Yes, Jesus died. By his stripes you are healed. But every time we yield to Satan, we are giving legal ground and opening up avenues like portals. It hasn't stolen your salvation. 
If you sin, you commit a sin after salvation, you haven't lost your salvation. But what have you done? You have given legal right to the enemy. And that enemy will use every opportunity that you give him. That is why our need for the Holy Ghost is so important. The Holy Spirit, he convicts us of sin. When we do that thing, he's saying, come on, you can do better. Come on, my son. Come on, my daughter. You can do better than that. Come, let me empower you. You put on a bit of worship music. You start to get lost in your love for Jesus. Those temptations, they just fade away. You spend some weeks and you, you haven't had time for a quiet time. You haven't had time to connect with the Lord or to read His Word. And you start finding these temptations coming up again. And the Holy Spirit the whole time is saying, come on. Come on, you can do better. Come on, I've got more for you. I've got fullness for you. Don't settle for second best. And as we move forward with life, the Holy Spirit grows us through the process of sanctification. And sanctification is me choosing God, choosing to bow my knee to Jesus rather than bow to the enemy. And every time I make a mistake, I say, Lord, I don't want to be that person. Help me. Forgive me for that. Help me, Lord. I don't want to be that angry person. I don't want to be that drunk person. I don't want to be that, that person that is abusive or addicted. I don't want to be at large. Help me. And every time we reach out, the Holy Spirit does something more within us. And we get stronger. And we get stronger. And we get stronger. And our ability to resist temptation increases. Doesn't mean we're not able to choose sin. I think every safe person has gone through that process of bowing their knee to the enemy at some time or other. But each time we open up that channel of communication through temptation, we strengthen His influence in our life. And if we continue along those lines of strengthening His interaction, we can build strongholds. And strongholds can be difficult to tear down. But nothing is greater than our Jesus. Nothing can prevent you from tearing it down. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. We need to be walking in the spirit. It's not about how good can I be as a person. Because the Bible says I am rotten inside. It's about how much can I walk in the spirit. How much Holy Spirit. How much can I look to you. How much can I walk with you. Because the more I'm walking with you, the less of this nonsense is taking place. So what kind of strongholds, what kind of demonic challenges, what kind of things can happen as we open those doors to the enemy? Well, refusing to forgive others, it can result in compromised health. The Bible says, forgive. We can choose not to forgive. It is a sin. It is a sin that is empowering the enemy to work in our life. And the whole time the Holy Spirit is saying, you've got to let go of that thing. You've got to forgive them. And you know what our response is? They don't deserve it. And probably it's true. But we don't forgive people because they deserve it. We forgive them because God has forgiven us. And the measure which we use shall be used for us. So we forgive. If we harbor bitterness, you know, bitterness, it can release acids in your body. Acids which are harmful for you, which can affect joints, which can affect various things. Bitterness will eat you up on the inside. You need to let it go. Sorry, Lord, I've been bitter. Forgive me. I refuse to be a bitter person. Cleanse me, Lord. Habitual anger can drive up your blood pressure and influence certain organs in your body. Lord, forgive me. 
for being angry. Help me to work with it, Lord, because I don't know how the Holy Spirit is here and He is helping you. He's wanting to lead you through these things. God doesn't want you to have ill organs and raise blood pressure through anger. He wants you to let it go. He wants you to rest in Him. Rest in the Lord. Ongoing heaviness or depression, it will compromise your immune system. If you're going through a time and you are flat, you are feeling heavy, your immune system is down. You can pick up everything that's going around. We need to spend time in His presence and saying, Lord, all those people that have hurt me, I release them. Fill me with your presence. In your presence is fullness of joy. I desire your joy more than holding others guilty. I release them. These are the kind of sins that we as Christians can so easily do. We can fall into the trap of the enemy because we are thinking at a fleshly level. The flesh wants to get even. The flesh does not want to forgive those that have hurt you because they don't deserve it. And God is saying, don't walk in the flesh. That's not where you should be. I've called you to walk in the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, you will be free of those things. Because your flesh is working against your spirit. Who do you choose to be? A spirit being made in my image? Or a fleshly being that is bowing its knee to the enemy? We need to choose. It's God's will for you to live under the shadow of the Most High. In that beautiful place where there is peace. Peace inside here. Peace inside here. Peace in relationships. That is God's will for you and for me. Where we are safe. That safe place. Under His wings as it were. Not walking around in the darkness. Vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. And the choices we make all have an impact. All choices have a consequence. Like when you take that paper inside your medication and you read the side effects. And some of them are, whoa. I need medicine to cure me from the side effects of the medicine. So too with choices, there are side effects, there are consequences. And the enemy wants to hide all that small print from you so that you never get to read it. So that you don't even acknowledge that there's consequences for your actions. God wants to protect you from your bad choices. He wants to protect you from the bad consequences. But are you listening? Are you submitting to Him? Are you choosing to walk in the Spirit? Or are you doing what you want to do? I did it my way, or I did it God's way. The enemy purposes to cause as much distraction to keep your eyes off the Lord. He's going to try to distract you in every way possible. He wants to create as much destruction in your life to keep you from the fullness of that which God has for you. Our job is to fix our eyes on Jesus, doing what Jesus tells us to do, so that there is no opportunity for the enemy to distract. There's no opportunity for him to cause destruction. Because unless you give him legal right, he has no right. No, I'm not saying all, all sickness is from sin. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, all sin has a consequence, whether you are a believer or not. Our sin can keep us away from God's best for us in this life he has. It can give the enemy opportunity in our physical lives to wreak havoc. It's one thing being made whole and righteous as a spirit being. But however many years you are on this earth, you have a fleshly body. 
You are living in this physical world. God wants more for you. The enemy wants to destroy you. Every sin is rebellion to God to some degree. Every sin results in us bowing our knee to Satan to some degree. And we need to be careful how much of that bending of the knee we do to the enemy. Because it all comes at a price in this physical realm. We mustn't be surprised if through habitual sin, you have a cloudiness in your mind. You can't think straight. There's a cloudiness that's hovering about. Or a heaviness in your emotions. Or a weakness in your body. All sin comes at a price. And this life is an opportunity for us to show God our heart. This is a filtering ground that we are living in. God wants all people with Him to spend eternity with Him. It's not His will for any to perish, but all to come to the knowledge of salvation. But He only wants those that choose, that want to be there. He only wants those that, that are desiring to worship, desiring His presence, wanting to be with Him. For everyone that wants to be with Him, that has received Jesus, is in relationship with Him. And you're on your way to heaven. God is seeking those. He's seeking people of worship. That is why our times of worship in this place are so important. It's what God is seeking. It's what brings Him down to dwell amongst us. In such a beautiful way. The more we fix our eyes on him. The less of the distractions we will even notice. Those temptations we won't even see them. Because we'll be so busy fixing our eyes on Jesus. Let us major on what God tells us to do. And turn our backs on the plans of the enemy. Let us love the Lord our God with all our heart all our soul, and all our mind. If we can get that first commandment right, there will be no opportunity for the enemy to distract us. Because all of our heart and mind and soul will be fixed on him. There's no opportunity for distractions. Our heart will be loving him. Our soul will be full of his presence. And our mind will be full of thoughts about him. No opportunity for bad thoughts or evil deeds or negativity. We are on our way to heaven. Let's live lives of joy which reflect the path that we are on. Let us encourage one another to press on towards the goal set before us. Because it's not a solitary walk, this Christian walk. We walk it as a body. And God is interested in the body. And I am part of this body. Together we cross the finish line. We're not envious of somebody else that is doing something great, who's flying spiritually. We're not envious because together we are crossing this finish line. Hallelujah. So my message this morning is plain and simple. My message this morning says that if you have received Jesus, truly have come to repentance in bowing your knee to Him and receiving Him as your Lord and Savior, you are on your way to heaven. But how you function the side of the grave will impact your life here. In body, mind, and spirit, let us be wise let us fix our eyes and let us love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. In Jesus' name. So, Heavenly Father, I lift up th these beautiful people, Lord, that you have brought, brought together this morning. And I speak, Lord, your anointing. Your anointing, Lord, to be able to look to you. To be able to walk with you in a, in a fresh way. To enjoy you in a greater way. And for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to so stir each one of us up on the inside. That all of our heart, mind, and soul is towards you. 
that the enemy will have no time of day in our life. We will not give him a foothold. Instead, Lord, we will be burning fires for you, on fire, loving you, looking to you. I speak, Lord, your blessing and favor and protection upon these people. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.